Captain Walker. I knew that he was um, a regular officer. I sussed that out because uh, I was very keen on having a, a regular officer because all officers are death or glory boys. <laughs> that seems to be bred into them to be death or glory boys. But the regular officers at least know what they're doing when they go in for death or glory <laughs> exploits <laughs> and you have a fair chance of coming out of them alive whereas survival is the main theme of the lower decks life <laughs> and of course the survival is, is governed by whoever is the skipper what he decides and his skill and dexterity of extricating himself from any of these death or glory exploits is decided upon well, he was the first man uh, to really uh, uh, to create a, a, a really good escort group. I think it was a 36 escort group, and it was a combination of probably one destroyer, two frigates, and several flower-class corvettes. And we worked up so that more or less everyone knew his job from ship to ship, escort duty. I think we had uh, six... I think we had six kills, three in one convoy. We uh, destroyed one U-boat by shell fire and ramming. We picked up a few four or five survivors. We destroyed another U-boat by depth charges and picked up uh, remains, bodies of German crew, the heart and lungs of a German U-boat sailor, which we took back aboard the stock and was pickled in alcohol by the doctor. And uh, when we arrived at Gibraltar, the captains of the convoy were invited aboard the stoke to view the remains. <laughs> it, uh, it gave the uh, captains of the merchant uh, fleet a bit of a boost to know that we were doing something about the U-boat attacks. Another born leader of men, my view, born leader of men. How did he differ from Mountbatten? I think he had more ex experience of seamanship, for one thing. See, Mountbatten was predominantly a long-service signal officer, wasn't he? I'm not saying he wasn't a good captain, but Walk had, had the experience. See, when the war broke out, he was on the shelf, as they call it, as a commander, and his first job was with was Admiral Ramsey and the evacuation of Dunkirk. Operation Dynamo. And uh, he certainly knew anti-U-boat technique because he was a specialist. But he was a very, very... a direct man. Didn't suffer fools in that. Tall and aggressive looking. I think I found out what he was going to be like before this convoy, Trace Gibraltar, which is going on, the dynamo went off the board because we lost power. Well, being, being a bit worried, I went on the bridge. We've lost power, so the wire said, that's your job. That's all he said. So I nipped down below and tried to do some other thing out. And he sent me the next day, he said, well, look, I'm not interested in what you're doing. I'm trying to rely on you thoroughly. If you're in trouble, then, you know, let me know what's going on. But I'm not in that, really. 
you're the expert and carry on with it. I thought, oh, well, you can do what you want now as long as you straight up with the old man. He was a very good leader, but he wanted you to do his job as well. Of course, he had what we called in those days style. I think it's charisma now. But uh, he definitely had personality. And I could never understand why he was passed over in peacetime. Because he was the definitive naval officer. Tall, commanding, as I say, with personality. But, um, and as far as we could see, very efficient indeed. But he was passed over in the promotion stakes after the war. And of course in Peacetown, once you got passed over, that's where you stayed. There was no chance of you getting any promotion. It's only war time. It's only a war that creates opportunities through obvious reasons for promotion. Flamboyant. He was a great one for, as most naval officers are, for signals. Witty or traditional signals. He, um, he was the first one to always general chase, which was um, a flag signal from uh, uh, Nelson's day. Meaning everybody in the flotilla or fleet to pursue the enemy. And it's, he used to love going in with this signal fluttering from the yard arm. And, uh, he had phrases he liked. One I can remember was uh, never a dull moment. It's all part of life's rich pattern. Well, particularly when we've made a balls up uh, attack, which we did. All very fair, very strict, very fair. And, uh, he was unsmiling if you were in front of him on a disciplinary charge, but uh, of course it, it's difficult to say from the lower deck. You, you, you don't come into a lot of contact with the, the captain of a vessel. In fact, his officers don't come into contact to a great deal with him. He has a separate quarters from them which is generally adjacent to the bridge so that he can be up there as quickly as possible. It's generally immediately under the bridge. Their quarters are stern in the, in the wardroom, on the quarter deck. But um, inevitably in, in his relaxed moments in the wardroom, he was the life and soul of the party. He could drink a pint of beer stood on his head. I don't know what relevance that has to it, but he... That was one of his party tricks. <laughs> he, he was human. From the day that Captain Walker joined the Stark, everything changed in the ship. So at sea, you saw quite a lot of him. He was always, he was always on the bridge, a very an active man. And he, was, uh, he was a very likeable man and a very efficient man. And all the crew thought the world of him. Captain Walker was so keen that uh, he used to take, particularly the stock, and we used to practice boarding a British submarine off the Irish coast, boarding it with the view. Captain Walker's ambition was to capture a U-boat intact and tow it back into Plymouth. So we used to practice this procedure, the taking a U-boat into boarding a submarine, putting a wire onto it, and uh, so we, if he, uh, if it did happen that we ever could get one in tow, that was his ambition. I joined the stock in 1939, either a week before or a week after war it was declared. The ship itself was uh, 1,060 ton, I think, and we had uh, four-inch guns with 0.5 machine guns 
amidships, various Lewis guns throughout the ship, a couple on the bridge, and uh, I think the top speed was about 18 to 20 knots. I think they were designed as uh, ACAT cover for convoy duty as well as anti-submarine, a combination of the two. The, uh, the seamen's quarters was very cramped. The air was bad. Everything was damp. The food was rough. <laughs> but... Uh, Sometimes there was uh, six inches of water in the foremast stick if we had bad weather. But apart from that, it was a good seagoing ship. She had been a peacetime sur survey ship, a sloop. She was flat bottomed with a shallow draft in order to go close inshore to make. Uh, navigational sightings so she was a swine at sea of course because she was never meant for Atlantic weather she was definitely meant for coastal waters where she could because of her shallow draft go close in to examine and make a correct survey of whatever area she was sent to do I was trainer on a B twin four inch. That's to train the gun from left to right, or port to starboard. With a gun screw of about twelve. Gun layer. Trainer, captain of the gun, fuel setters, and loading numbers. The gun layer lays the gun on the target from overhead to water level and the trainer goes from port to starboard I was in communication with the the director he gave ranges and fuel settings when, it, when one of the guns was under control of the director it came through headphones and the headphones was on the fuel setter I believe the captain of the gunner actually fired the gun. He made the interceptor and it was either fired from the director by electric circuit or he could fire it by the gun layer, captain of the gun. Occasionally, if there was any breakdown of communications, then we had to go on to everything by hand, which was the training and firing from telescopes by the gun layer and the trainer. There comes a certain stage when you become an able seaman, when you have to pick what is known as a non-sub rate, a non-substantive rate. And uh, in those days it could be a gunnery, torpedo, later radar, or ASDIC, anti-submarine. And uh, the anti-submarine part was considered to be the elite. I think it was... Uh, because you had to have a rather higher standard of education to, um, to master not the intricacies of submarine detection so much, but the upkeep of the equipment, which was like a very sophisticated wireless set, as we call it in those days, and been able to trace faults in those circuits and, of course, repair them. And also, we'd, I'd heard that they got a very fine barracks at Portland near Weymouth and it was true when I got there it was very true there were beds instead of hammocks <laughs> and, uh, and a very pleasant part of the country Portland Bill well that was watch keeping mainly on the uh, see I had a fairly good uh, knowledge of short wave because in those days, 
short way was a very difficult thing to put up with. You know, you had very, very indistinct signals, and one had to pick out the signal coming in properly. And that was the main job we had, really, decoding of signals as well, and coding. Patience. Uh, and determination. Because you've got to stay with that target. And not get depressed if you lose it. Because there's always a routine for picking it up again. And also, Captain Walker was brilliant at determining what the U-boat commander decided to do. Well, sometimes I used to think they read the same manuals. The U-boat skippers and the Royal Navy officers as well. Because <laughs> they knew exactly. For some reason or other, but you, you see, you won't... You, nearly invariably lost the submarine or the U-boat when you went over and attacked because you dropped a pattern of depth charges which created havoc with your, with your acoustics and also gave you back false echoes. And, of course, that was when the Yugo commander made his evasive action under the cover of the turbulence caused by the depth charges. And for some reason or other, I never fathomed this, what it got to do with you, submarines, they always went upwind. Now, what's that got to do with a submerged craft? I've no idea what the wind has got to do with it. But Captain Walker said, told us to do a search upwind. And invariably, we redetected the target. And that this could go on several times with a clever U-boat commander. Because he would vary his tactics, he would vary his depths. And at the early stages of the war, we had no, no idea of uh, the depth of the U-boat we were attacking. It was sheer guesswork. If you were an Aztec racing, you realised that uh, they were very efficient, very clever indeed, at evading, being <laughs> destroyed. The Asdik said, sending out this uh, high-frequency note known as a ping, um, which was caused by sending an electric impulse through a quartzo-electric uh, a pizza quartz crystal suspended in a dome beneath the ship, which gave out this echo, this uh, transmission, and the water being a, a very good conductor of sound was able to travel quite far and uh, if it impinged on anything solid of anything solid wrecks whales submarine it would give you back an echo and um, the skill was in diagnosing whether the echo was from a submarine or a whale or a shoal of fish Wrecks were difficult, of course, except that they were static. But the, the sound was the same from a steel wreck as it would be from a submarine. Of course, a submarine would be moving and would give you the, a Doppler effect. So that the, the pitch of the, the note of the echo was different from that of the transmitted ping. And the, the great part of the skill of finally chasing and destroying a submarine was to analyse this Doppler effect, the change in the Doppler told you what the submarine was doing. If it was going away from you, the pitch was much lower, it was ping whoop. If it was coming towards you, straight, it was much higher than the pitch. And of course variations in that according to whether it was at what angle it was going away from you or approaching you. And it was analysing this difference in pitch, the Doppler effect, that was very important in finally destroying the U-boat. But later on we had a, a device called the sword, which um, it was a, a slim uh, transmitter, the same piezoelectric quartz, um, but it, you could move it in a vertical angle, whereas 
the ordinary athlete was in the uh, horizontal plane. Right? And uh, so you could t t tilt it backwards. At, and the, the angle it was at when you've got the echo and combined with the range, which you got from your recorder, knowing the speed of sound through water, um, you could then work out the depth. And w what about a shoal of fish or even a whale? Whale um, was very difficult indeed. Because, uh, as you probably know, they, they whistle. And it's very similar to the, the whistle of a hydroplane moving on, on a submarine. Uh, very difficult indeed. You, the, the quality of the echo was the difference. It was slightly softer. You didn't get the metallic bing back from whale. Not so normally its movement was slower, but we have we have attacked and dropped a pattern on on a whale in mistake. But it it is understandable because obviously they move very similarly to a submarine, about the same speed when they're just cruising along underwater. The noise is from them and from many fish. It's deceptive. Dolphins, porpoises also make whistling noises, but whales in particular. All of them, we've seen them come up. The, the, the U-boat itself come up, generally stern first, and then dive down again. But you don't always accept that as a kill, because that's another ploy that they will do. You still chase after that one. L Large amounts of oil, yes, but as I emphasise, large amounts of oil, because that's another ploy, release some oil. Uh, large amounts of debris and human remains, once again I emphasise large, because they have been known to, to fire out dead bodies out of the torpedo tubes. <laughs> so, so it was, we made certainly it was large amounts of debris before we claimed a kill. What kind of duties was Stark engaged on when you joined her in April 41? Uh, convoy escort, uh, Atlantic convoys. I think we went to what is called 20 west, 20 degrees west. And it was purely um, escort duties. We went out, we escorted one out there, outward bound, and picked up a homeward bound and brought that back to Liverpool. We were based for a large part of the war, I'm happy to say, in Liverpool. Bootle, to be exact. We don't want to upset people's feelings. It was, no, I don't think it was ever boring on the Atlantic convoys because. If you didn't have the enemy to contend with, you had the sea. And we were in relatively small ships. Now, the smaller ones were the corvettes. I don't know what life was like on those. Well, they were just glorified trawlers, corvettes were. But on a sloop, and I suppose on a destroyer as well, which were larger, but um, not all that large, the, um, the seas could be very frightening. The, uh, the trough of the wave could hide the ship in front of you. It was deep enough to hide the ship in front of you. And it was like being on the Hell's Skelter. Exciting at first, but of course, a bit wearying over a long period, keeping your balance. And of course, keeping your cutlery and your crockery intact and managing to be fed by the chefs who did a marvellous job, the cooks. It was the main theme that was hammered into us, that um, there was more danger of us being blockaded into surrender than being bombed or, or shelled or forced into surrender in any other way. Starvation will drive anybody to surrender, and that was constantly hammered into us. 
and we were given fairly correct details of our motion ship losses to hammer this point home. Because they were defenceless. They were a sitting ducks type of thing, and it was the only the efficiency of the of the escorts that uh, gave them any chance at all. U-boats at that day used to hunt in packs of 10, 14 at a time. And it was a very hard life for the merchant men. Ammunition ships, tankers, very rough. The, um, it was the incessant pitching and rolling and the, no ship is watertight so the water got, gets everywhere it's, the wasp and the cold but of course that is nothing compared with the moments the Russian convoys the cold and there was something I would never have believed until I'd experienced it oh, that was hell in every respect the Aztec set was useless because it was fresh water mainly from the glaciers in the Arctic, you see. So the more polluted the water is, the better your sound wave travels. I don't mean pollution as we understand it today, but in the salty sea, the, the sound wave travels very well indeed and the returning echo. But in pure water, it won't travel at all. So we had submarines coming up, U-boats coming up, 1,500 yards away from us that we never detected or heard. Not even heard them. They heard their engines, because that's sound and that won't travel through water. And they came up. Fortunately, most of them, well, nearly all of them, were as horrified as us and hurriedly dived. And got out of it. Because... We, we were ran in and attacked and dropped a pattern, but it was sheer guesswork based on where they, we'd seen them dive. We couldn't hear them. So the Aztec was completely useless? Yes, in fresh water and freshish water, it is useless. The guns were frozen solid. And it is true that if you touch steel with your bare hand in those conditions, it will stick to it. Convoy HG-76, which was a fairly big convoy. It was a convoy that was supposed to have broken the back of the U-boats. Well, this convoy left Jeb in December 1941, and when we went to the convoy conference, we realised it was going to be a fairly big, con important convoy, because the escort had been doubled by addition of other outlying escort vessels. I think there were about 32 ships involved in the convoy. And uh, we had the first escort carrier, which was the Audacity, a converted uh, merchant ship. And I think the convoy lasted about 10 to 14 days. During that time we lost two merchant ships. The Audacity was sunk and the American destroyer Stanley, which we'd you know, the night and nine year release thing. And uh, we shot down four Fokker Wolves, I think, and killed four U boats. We attacked, we attacked a U boat in conjunction with the Flower Cast Corvette. And uh, it, Captain Walker described it as a, a copybook attack that something they learned at Asdic School. The first pattern of charges was slightly too deep and this next pattern destroyed the U-boat. The U-boat exploded under the sea. Terrific explosion. And there was no survivors. We picked up uh, part of a stretch and found a 
sheepskin coat, rubber trousers, and the heart and lungs of German sailor. These parts was pickled by the ship's doctor and taken to Gibraltar, where they were viewed by the captains of merchant fleet. Now, one of the big kills there was done by the stork, our ship. Uh, the the U boat that had sunk the St Stanley was astern of us, and our Captain Walk had a very special uh, U boat um, depth charge operation called Buttercup, Operation Buttercup, where they released all their depth charges astern. Immediately, as soon as you got a contact, they dropped all the depth charge and then carried out the normal attack. And the stand they was had just been torpedoed. We carried on the counter attack, and it, t it took us about uh, half an hour, I suppose. And the stalk, the stalk, and the U boat U five seven four were going round in ever diminishing circles. We couldn't use any guns because they were too near to depress the guns. The first lieutenant did use a strip Lewis gun. Captain Walker was very much his own <laughs> centric techniques. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, I think the most well-known one was uh, the Buttercup attack. Whereas when we got a very cunning uh, adversary, he used, to, he used to line up whatever ships he had available, in line abreast, and they would go forward at a reasonable speed, and just cluster the area with depth charges. Generally set deep, because normally if we got to that stage, the U-boat had decided the safest place was to go deep. And the U-boats could go rather deeper than we thought at the time, actually. They were very well constructed. But the, that, the idea was to plaster like an artillery plastering of the air, but all going forward and dropping a carpet of, in other words, spraying the sea with a buttercup of adept charges. That was his favourite. I am fire on you, uh, but actually it was about uh, three o'clock in the morning and we'd had several skirmishes with U-boats, depth charging and star shell firing and we was in communication with a Stanley which was American four-funneled destroyer part of the Less Lend and Lease program she was in contact with a U-boat and the U-boat had fired torpedoes the, uh, the next minute the Stanley exploded and she'd caught two torpedoes and was destroyed in seconds. The other two torpedoes passed to our stern and we circled round behind the Stanley and picked up the echo of the U-boat. We f attacked the U-boat with several patterns of depth charges. The U-boat came to the surface and we followed it round in two or three circles, it turning inside our circle. The machine, point five machine gunner amidships opened fire on the U-boat, which was too close for us to get at, kind of thing. Opened fire on the U-boat and Everybody was diving with colour cover. There was 0. 0.5 bullets ricocheting all over the place. We then drew to port or starboard and opened fire on the U-boat. I think one hit was recorded, and by this time, Captain Walker announced standby to ram. The crew took appropriate action, and we rammed the U-boat amidships. The U-boat rolled over under the stalk, 
partly lifting the stoke out of the water as we overrode her. We uh, pushed 12 foot of the bows back of the stark, but hold the U-boat. The U-boat then came out of the water in a vertical position with about 20 of the U-boat in the air stood out vertical with the U-boat survivors jumping out screaming and shouting and hauling life belts. But anyway, we did pick up, uh, I think it was six survivors from the U-boats. And we rescued four German sailors and uh, they came back on the stalk. There's one thing where I helped uh, you, one of the U-boat sailors up the scrambling net and he spat at me. And the next night after this had gone, the Deptford rammed us. By mistake, thought we were a U-boat. And it's always amazed me, apparently two of those four U-boat sailors were SS men. I believe they used to carry SS men in the ships. And they were, they were lost. Because this... Uh, Deptford went into the cabin where they were prisoners. The two ordinary lads were saved, but the SS fellows went, which is most unusual, really. We were rammed by the Deptford through the quarterdeck, killing two of the U-boat survivors. Captain Walker came back to look at the damage and immediately fell through the hole in the quarterdeck among the remains of the Germans. He was dragged out and none the worse for his experience. But by this time the stoke was in a bit of a state with 12 foot of the bows pushed back and now a, a great gash in the quarterdeck. Well, we took a convoy out from uh, Lock U. We took a store convoy out all the way down to Algiers. On the way out, just before we got to Algiers, we attacked a U-boat that was attacking the Rodney. And I think on that occasion we messed our Asdiks up. So the Asdik was stuck to the, <coughs> the dome. And that night we were torpedoed off Algiers. Well, I think there were two fired. One hit far and blew the bows off. And the other one up didn't go off. Well, I thought we were in collision at first. Because I was more or less asleep and a bit tired. Made a mess of the bow, though. Heck of a mess. But nobody was hurt. We got back to Algiers... Went into dock there, and I felt worse off there at sea because we were torpedoed. We were dive bombed every minute. It was the beginning of the operation, you see. We were torpedoed in the Bay of Algiers by German U-boat. Several ships uh, going backwards and forwards across the, the mouth of the Bay of Algiers protect the convoy which was laid inside and uh, about uh, two or three o'clock in the morning we were we picked up an echo as a U-boat on the surface close inshore and we turned out a line to investigate this and were torpedoed uh, which destroyed the uh, fault of the ship Fortunately, again, no one was killed. The uh, paint shop got on fire and uh, the crew's quarters for it was uh, more or less destroyed. We uh, went into Algiers 
next morning and we were patched up by the French duckyard people who uh, made a makeshift repairs to get us to Gibraltar and our own people strengthened the job and we eventually made our way back to nearest port in England which was Falmouth by this time the ship was nearly falling in half it was the shock of the explosion had uh, compressed the ship and the lot had welded uh, steel girders across the uh, damage it was it was a very rough trip and the the uh, hall of the crew's quarters was flooded and everything wet food was bad and it was a long slow journey on our own back to England the ship was repaired and it became a fishery protection vessel after the war very strong and seaworthy ship 